Waalaikumsalam. Atar bhai, apni aske mainly ye kore na. Ami kuchh kotha kum bolbo. Slago Rubik, sir, 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 Vivo, আমরা কি শুরু করতে পারবো? ভাইয়া আর একটু সময় নিব। ওকে। মিশু ভাই আসসালামু আলাইকুম। ওয়া আলাইকুম আসসালাম। ভালো আছেন? এই তো। তোমার সুন্দর লাগছে আপনাকে হ্যাঁ? মোসিন তোমরা ই ই তিন লোকজন থাকলে তো আরো ইসিজি আমি আর বলবই না। ইন্টারভেনশন নিয়ে কথা বলবো। Assalamu alaikum and good evening. We are live now. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, dear physicians. This is 56th sessions of our lecture series, case-based ECG organized by ECG study group. And today we have amongst us, Professor Dr. Saidur Rahman Khan, Professor and Senior Consultant, Ibrahim Cardiac Hospital and Research Institute. Before the start of the session, I'd like to request Professor Ema Tarli, sir, to say a few words regarding Professor Saidur Rahman Khan, sir. And then we proceed the lecture. Atar Ali, sir. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Tushar, for inviting me. And this is Professor Saidur Rahman Khan, very much close to me, one of my favorite person, one of the very popular and leading interventional cardiologists of this country, and one of the icon cardiologists, I say, of this country. is very much popular among the young cardiologists. He's a good teacher good speaker and one of the leading very dynamic interventional cardiologists, I can say. This is Professor Abdul Rahman, uh, that is uh, Saidur Rahman Khan, is a professor and senior consultant working at the Ibrahim Cardiac Center, Professor Saidur Rahman Khan. I have heard his several lectures at the different forum. He's a good speaker. I am always one of his fan. So, Professor Saidur Rahman Khan, I'm inviting, I'm very much happy. I'm, happy I'm feeling shy. I'm feeling shy. <laughs> Professor Saidur Rahman Khan is very much icon, icon <laughs> cardiologist, I think. Professor Abdul Wadud Sodri, do you want to say something about this young dynamic cardiologist that is Professor Saidur Rahman Khan? Assalamu alaikum, everybody, and good evening. Actually, I know him uh, by his nickname when he was a third uh, year student. Uh, his nickname is Mishu, and we used to call him that. But nowadays, we have to call him Professor Dr. Saidi Rahman Khan. He is versatile in his intervention, in his presentation, in his interpretation. And he is a dynamic person, also a poet, a literature, a very versatile person. I do hope our young stars who are listening to us, they'll be emulating him not only in academic field, not only in the life of cardiology, as a, as, as a cardiologist, but also as a person who can write a poem, who can tell a story, who can recite a poetry, like anything. 
And that's what Dr. Sayyid Raman Khan is. Let us enjoy together what he presents in front of us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Dr. Sayyid Raman Khan. Thank you, thank you. I'm just so much speechless, spellbound hearing these things. I'm sharing my screen. I think you're seeing my screen. You're seeing my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. So I want to start in that way that wilds are beautiful in the world and child is beautiful in mother's lap. In Bengali, we can tell Bonera Boni Shundor, Shishura Matri Kore. This is because talking about ECG as an interventionist is like left it behind and sometimes I forgot it a bit. But this modality since 1903 is the essential most one to understand the heart. We should and we should not forget, we always rely on it. We should rely on it. And that's why I'm trying to recapitulate my ECG skill as much as I can in front of all these passionate and very, very learned specialists. Today, my topic is projected tours, ECG blended with intervention. Just uh, I am telling that one because it's like something that uh, I only can remember the essay, The River but you have given me the essay, the cow. So literally I have forgot, it, forgot the essay of the cow. So what I will do, I will take the cow in the river bank and then, will, then I will start telling about the river. This is like this. So especially to understand the role of CG after PCI. So I'm blending it with intervention to make it comfortable for me. So this is the case one, the case of chronic coronary syndrome. The patient is uh, 63 years old with class three and you know, last one year despite maximal medical treatment and all the risk factors she has like hypertension, diabetes, and dyspepidemia. And now this time is, she has presented with class three to four and their angina and uh, her ETT was positive two or three times, but she declined every time to go for an invasive procedure. This time, she couldn't resist herself because her symptoms are very, very much uh, frightening for her. And ECG, I'm showing later an ejection fraction almost all the time in CCS cases, naturally is preserved. So this is the baseline ECG until here. I think this ECG is pretty like normal ECG or whatever it is. Only what you have in V1 to V3, some sort of STT changes. So my question is here, which you can put in the poll in this 63 year old female, would you consider this ECG significant for ischemia? Yes or no? I think the pollster is here. I think she can start the poll with a very simple question. Sir, should we start the poll? Yes, we yeah. start the poll in 30 seconds. You please vote, dear participants. Nice. I think I'm going to, for this, uh, for this is, uh, we can put it for 15 seconds only because it's a very pretty simple answer. So clearly A wins, Said Roman. Yes. The significant for ischemia in which town? I mean, uh, that's the issue is here that this ECG. I think can you can you just can you just let me in in my sh sharing the slides? So this ECG is a 
I, I you know that is a normal sinus rhythm almost so the only thing is that minor HTP changes in the V1 to V3 but still considering the symptoms and if you only see the ECG and then this is uh, uh, nothing but a normal variant sometimes can I ask my expert panels about this one the answers what they're telling in favor of ischemia whether it is absolutely true or not, I'm asking these things to our expert panels. Professor Saidurovan, that T inversion yep. in V1, V2, and V3, yep. most of the times can be found normally in case of female and, yeah, the, that's yeah. and in the black person, I think. Yeah. So, uh, but. Uh, Definitely, this should be considered with the symptoms, definitely. So, so, that, comment, so the answer is uh, more in the yes for, for what reason? Knowing the history or seeing the ECG only? Knowing the history. Actually, a ECG contain at least two information, the age and the sex. And depending upon that, we often interpret it even without knowing much of the rest of the thing. And if it is a ECG which comes a, in a 23-year-old female, I would not pay attention that much. But when it is a 63-year-old female, I would be asking, what are the rest of the symptoms? And I would be considering most of, most of the time, it's not a normal variation. I would say this is an uh, anterior scheme, antiseptic scheme. And I'd like to make a comment on that, uh, as Dr. Wadud mentioned, that there's a, we call it juvenile pattern uh, to inversion in V1 to V3. That is seen in young female patients. That's exactly right that Dr. Wadud mentioned, because age is a discriminating factor because like 50, 60 age, you know, we normally don't expect that. So always, it could be variant normal, but still we, we have to think about it, this potential underlying ischemic cause or any you know, right ventricular problem going on also at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's is a concern we need to keep in mind, particularly uh, age is a big factor and definitely history comes into play. If it comes, my question is here now that if it comes so that the patient is not talk, telling any any symptoms in this 63 year old female for and uh, not that much a uh, symptom like you know that females sometimes uh, give some sort of atypical symptom that here and there pain chin chin pin pin something like this so in that case whether we'll go for further evaluation seeing this ECG or we'll leave it alone yes professor Saidurman, we should go as because normally mm -hmm. in case in the frontal plane the T inversion is normally present in lead 3, AVR, and in V1. Mm -hmm. Other than these three leads, that is V1, AVR, and lead 3, mm -hmm. we, should, should, we should search for the cause. as because in this case, the T inversion is present in V2 and V3. Mm -hmm. This should not be ignored. That is presence of the T inversion in lead V3 and v, uh, v, v, V2 and V3. And again, the characteristics of the T wave in these two leads there is some yeah. uh, it is asymmetry and it is nearly two millimeter up to one millimeter is acceptable i think in v1 and v2 but the presence of asymmetrical t wave inversion other than v1 in v2 and v3 definitely should raise the question mm -hmm. of probability of something else other than the normal so we should go mm -hmm. for the investigation Sir, yeah. i have a question in the yeah. baseline ekg in the baseline ekg was there any T inversion? No, this is the baseline EKG. This, this is the baseline. Mm -hmm. Oh, there I'm is no just, previous I'm EKG. The, yeah, I'm the, no, no, this is the baseline EKG. Oh, there is no previous EKG to compare. No, no, there's no other previous EKG. This is the first so, time she is presenting uh, uh, to us without any documents before. From the so this is uh, primary T wave abnormalities. And in case of primary T wave abnormalities, which is not secondary to any other cause, such as mm -hmm. LVH or anything, it can be differential will be, you know, the, the, the juvenile. Mm -hmm. Juvenile pattern or T 
fewer abnormality because of the electrolyte imbalance or any other thing. But I think in the context of the clinical presentation, that raises ischemia possibility. Yeah, that's the thing I, I, I was just asking to our participants, especially those, the, the fellows who are hearing these things, that only the ECG, when we see, sometimes we have to report the ECGs like this. So when you report this ECG, the distant, you know, that sometimes you have to write down the ECG. So when you will write down the ECG, we'll, we will have some recommendation, just we can see the age and the sex and the ECG only. Any recommendation we'll write down in the ECG paper? Uh, Saidur, yep. that's actually because you were only a reporter, mm -hmm. you, you could not recommend that much. The primary physician, you only could say this is the probable atosephal ischemia. You can use mm -hmm. only probable, considering the okay. age of the case. Then the primary so, physician will decide what to do about the next so the ecg reporter will just uh, just say some uh, say something like this that please uh, exclude the clinical manifestations and other things or please exclude these changes evaluate by, by further investigations you can you can suggest only evaluate further for uh, the for yeah that's um, that's the point of because these are you know that uh, the regular so when we work the health centers and we have done this sort of seen is this sort of ECGs and the reports sometimes within normal limits somebody will write down right the problem I actually see in this country seeing this teen version mm -hmm. uh, many of the junior doctors and primary physicians they started giving dwelling platelet yeah also in the opposite side this will, this will come not be doing yeah there. yeah uh, even in chronic coronary syndrome, you can mm -hmm. give statin, you can give beta blocker, you can give nitrate, but you should not be using dual antiplatelet unless there is compelling indication or you are going for intervention very recently. So, so okay. you can, uh, you can, rise or anything like that. so you can tell that we're seeing that ECG, the primary physician also along with the symptoms can start the, uh, the normal guideline oriented anti ischemic therapies and the uh, aspirin or clopidogrel, whatever they usually write down. One one question Dr. Ojoy has raised, whether a T inversion has any localizing value or not. Hafiz mm -hmm. uh, will you uh, answer that? T inversion and then even the ST changes does not correlate with the regionality. But the ST elevation does. So even in the stress test, when you sometimes see this ST elevated depression, you can't just say that this is inferior and it is RCF. It may not be. Yeah. But when there's the ST elevation, then it is correlated with the territory. And then T inversion is, is, a, is, a, is, is I don't, it's a dynamic change from before is more important, but this is basically in this case is the clinical story and the teen version is just another objective sign that can go along with the history and presentation. Okay. So I'm not going to put too much importance in the TOA, but the clinical context is all that is important. The same thing in the and office, I would just put less importance. As yeah. Hafiz okay. was initially asking, uh, is it the baseline ECG or do we have any previous ECG? If the previous ECG actually showed that you were upright, but now it is uh, inverted, then it has some localizing value. Yeah, Other of course, it's different. Dynamic change is yeah. somewhat, somewhat important, but mm -hmm. the ST segment changes, the ST elevation is, has some localizing value actually. Okay. So, so we have a very what nice is, can discussion. I, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. sir. I, I think um, all of you made a point. Just to summarize it, I think we should move forward. One is, as Hafiz mentioned, if there is acute ST elevation, that localizes. And second, if I have this ECG, when I'm reading 100 ECGs and I have this ECG in front of me, what I'm going to, I'm going to describe the finding and I'll softly say, consider ischemia clinical correlation needed. Um, because Sometimes I see people write um, acute anterior ischemia, uh, this ischemia, I don't, we don't do that. 
we just say consider ischemia clinical coordination be there and let the clinician make the decision on this issue ask why why thank you okay thank you okay. sir so we are, we are, i'm going forward now so for this case with this sort of ecg and also the positive ett uh, stress test basic coronary angiogram is justifiable or not that's a big question if you go for this uh, ischemia trial then there is a big question there but if, even for them also, they have seen the coronary anatomies for all the cases. And also, this is the guideline which they are telling that if it is symptomatic patients with a high-risk clinical profile, this invasive coronary angiography, complemented by obviously you should have an FFR if you think of revascularization. So it's the class one recommendation. And also you can put this algorithm in front of yourself if you have this pet or pet scan, nuclear scans facilities on there then you can go and follow this algorithm. But in here, so we did angiogram according to the, the guidelines also. This is a class one recommendation. So here in the angiogram, sorry, my, my cursor is not moving. So here you can see that what is, there is a tandem eccentric lesion in LAD and a very nasty long segment severe disease in a very, very large principal vein involving oh. the proximal LCX. And also here you can see the same pictures and RC, I, I, I don't have the, uh, the live picture, but RC is uh, just uh, has no significant lesion. It's not unexpected considering the symptoms here with this sort of ECG. Then, what should it do now? Revascularization should be done. Patient is in, in GDMT for the last couple of months, yet symptomatic. Complete revascularization of both LED and L6, that's a big question. Or PCI to L6 plus FFR to LED followed by PCI to PCI if FFR or IFR is positive. <laughs> This client case, we plan for PCI to LED and LCX. Why? Because the LED lesion has got some plaque like burden, even angiographically, we can see that one. And it's more than 50% in proximal LED and around 70% in the middle, like mid LED. And she is on DAPT for last one year and loaded with more potent P2I inhibitor just before PCI. So we have done the PCI of the LED by 2.752 millimeter DES distally and three into 18 millimeter second generation DES proximally. And also the LCX, we have, I have just sweated a lot while performing this PCI to LCX when it was really, really very much fibrotic and even hardly the stent was crossing. Uh, but ultimately I have been able to and deploy a stand to point seven for 30 similar long second generation deaths. And the final picture, what you see here, is quite satisfactory from intervention's perspective. So it's an uneventful procedure. Post PCI, after you can see here, the post PCI ECG, 30 minutes post procedure, usually we take an ECG. And this ECG is Comparing with the previous ECG, you can see here that this ECG, whether something is evolving here, patient is asymptomatic, patient is just simply happy at that time in this ECG. Is something evolving here? Can you smell something bad here or not? I'm putting LCX this. LCX might have some problem during the procedure. LCX distally, there might have some issue. Can you there go back to the, that might uh, cause this sort of problem. If we, could have, uh, if we yeah. go back to the previous slide. Yeah, you can see. Now, look at the LCX beyond the, uh, the wave. There is mid, uh, the, the last wave is, uh, last wave is not that, uh, insignificant, it's quite significant. And before that, there is a, seems to be a lesion which would, could be could have been 
uh, evaluated by FFR because it Which one? produce some symptoms and it would be difficult to go to that lesion uh, through the stent structs. Yeah, these are very small caliber. You can even put a stent here. And uh, there's a difficult thing to say because uh, mm -hmm. the view, the uh, look at the band. At the band, uh, it doesn't look that bad. At least it is a two uh, two point two five. Point two five other way is because uh, later on there is there is because you will have put you have to put a long stand here and later on you may not have any enough space there if you really want to do something. Uh, if you uh, did, I don't know whether you did a, a RAO cranny, you can uh, see those distal vessels better. <laughs> but in in any case, the patient is doing good. We have seen, then I have why, just put some, just some focus picture here because it's an only, especially on the ECG. So that's why I didn't put too many pictures here because I was pretty happy with the standing yeah, procedures here. That's fine. Because yeah. I think you also, very small, you also, you, small you also agree vessels. with me. Yeah. 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 Agree. Then yeah. now question so, uh, is post-procedure. Yeah, yeah. Doing this okay. ECG. This ECG, whether you are smelling something or post-PCI ECG, we usually do after PCI, you know. So whether it's, a, it's a, you, you are smelling something here from this ECG, I have a previous ECG. I'm a smelling, when... but I, it's not enough to leave the room. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is 30 minutes post-procedure. After that, Here's the problem of an operator. When you smell something, then what you will do, you will you will tell your resident that do the serial ECGs every 15 or half an hour, if even the patient is not complaining anything. An hour later, again, the ECG is like this. Like the same, the proto copy of what we have seen 30 minutes after post-PCI. Nothing new that much changed here. Though, though there is a bad smell is coming out from this ECG, but still not that much significant. Is it? It is another two hours later. It was around 9 p.m. at that time. I can remember the time even. So patient started screaming and patient has severe angina and severe chest pain. And this is the ECG at that very moment. B5 and B6, you can see. And B1 to B3, some reciprocal ST depressions there. And even two ABF has got some ST elevation. So you are in trouble now. You need to go so in. <laughs> in comparison to these things. So seeing this ECG, the, my question is here to the polls that I'm telling the polling, why it might be the culprit vessel? LED, LCX, RCA, or LED plus LCX. Seeing this ECG. I think LCX. First of all, some, first of all, some practical thing that- I want to put it the, to the poll stars, to the among the recipients so that they can start uh, polling that one. So when yeah. the toss up is between LED versus CERT, I worry less. When the toss up between CERC and the RCA, then it is important more because you yeah. go up with the guide. Which guide you go up with? In this case, it will mm -hmm. be, I, I would get mad if somebody goes up with a diagnostic cap. Yeah. You, you'd, be, you'd be going with a, a guide with a, mm -hmm. because it's, not, it's going to be ugly. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just talking about the, from the ECG perspective. If you see the ECG for the first time, any fellow, and after seeing that ECG, like, like you know, AST elevation ECG like this, so which one will be the culprit? Okay, so what we are about, seeing Forgetting that, about the history. The, for, about the even even if you look at this, it's an inferior ST elevation, and there mm -hmm. is ST depression in the precordial leads. So you worry about RCA Not only that, only the B1 to B3, but B5, B6 Correct. has ST elevation, and and also that there is not new, no new changes in the one AVL, only the flattened T-way. So it is 
difficult to say from here that which one is more, two, three AVF, uh, mm -hmm. two or the three more, and then look at the lead one and AVL. All yeah. these, you know, the, there are tons of studies that, you know, we argue about RCA versus uh, uh, the circumflex. But here, there is an, another compounding factor whether this can, can it be LAD, unlikely. Yeah. Yeah, that that's why I have to put in the question LED yeah. plus LCX or not. Indeed. So the poll is telling that that LCX with 57%. For what reason the poll is thinking like that? I think I think the If we gone uh, to do done some intervention in the LCA, that's why everybody is thinking that. Could be also, the I have done intervention no, no, in the LED that's... also. Uh, B five, B six, and inferior leads. So uh, it is more in Later works. Later ball in yeah. public. That also mm -hmm. goes. And then you wrap around LED. I did not. Was the LED One... wrap around? Yep. No, was the no not the LED. That's why I'm telling the LCX is rather a bit co-dominant. That means a bigger. LCX. Right. Yeah, it should be the LCX. Yeah, that's I'm telling that. That's why maybe mm -hmm. everybody, or almost half of half of the poll is in favor of LCX. Hey, so I do go ahead. Proceed. Yeah. So basically, we will have a patient and a lateral wall. And you, I can just put this for the remembrance of, uh, of, uh, of my participants here that these are the things that ST segment elevation, if you see, I think lots of already it has been discussed several times in this institute group, so I'm not putting that one. So severe chest pain with dynamic C changes with so the elevation, new ST elevations. So this is according to the universal definition of myocardial infarction. It, it is in the group, in the type of F4. So, so whether it's F4A or F4B, because not what F4C for as a lesion. So it is most, it is mostly or probably it's for the be myocardial infarction. And if you see, there's a ST and thrombosis is one of the reasons here. And this is a, maybe if it is, I can put it angiographically or pathologically, but it's a definite, or it's so far now, up to now, it is a probable ST and thrombosis, with, and it is acute because it, it's within zero to 24 hours post implantation. It seems like definite is what is the plan? Immediate transport to Atlas, relook CAG, and solve the problem. A role of future coronary fibrinolitis. Is it there? Controversy is there. Role of GPI. Is a class 2 a recommendation in bailout situations sometimes? Like the guidelines of the microdial revascularization 2018 is SDC. A role of thrombus aspiration if we see an ST or sent most is there. This is class three in routine, in routine cases, like in total test, you can support routine thrombus aspiration. Not for this, it is not a routine case. And we have already in roll up everything, it has also been downgraded in the latest guideline to class two B. There one question I'll be asking. Uh, at the initial post PCI, after seeing the initial post PCI CG, what is the ACT? The ACT was uh, quite satisfactory to remove the shit. It was quite okay. Yeah. But it, 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 please, youngsters, remember that if post PCI is there any change, always check the ACT because uh, the person who is responsible for giving the uh, additional heparin may have missed that. I would no, suggest the, the, the that ACT was to take was care of it. That is, ACT was several, every time was satisfactory. We are happy that with that one. So what we have seen here, even patient was so screaming. Uh, we we are we have started screaming too. So not My it's God. not the picture of the uh, of of the the proper engagement even with the catheter initially. So I think the picture also you can see the whole LCX is thrombotic and totally occluded in the LCX frame. So 
dilated by NC balloon given ICGPI, yet thrombosis there very, very resilient, very incessant thrombosis there. From where it is coming so fast after three hours of stand deployment. And then we have to put another stand. And after that, the final picture is again satisfactory like the previous one. So I can tell. So issue has been resolved. 30 minutes after second intervention, this is the ECG. And you can see here, ST is coming down slowly. The next morning, it is all quiet in the Western Front. You can see here. So, in my own critics, reasons behind this type of stent thrombosis, what I have from the ARC is a device oriented cardiac events there, or patient oriented, or stent related. So, these three factors may be there. So stand we have used a second generation test. I, I, I think it's not, it's not the, the concrete, it's not the stand itself. Patient-related factors, obviously the plaque and the lesion characteristics of the patient was not really good, especially in LCX. And it's very much chaotic there. Procedure-related factors, I'm taking all the loads in myself. That is a long stand has been used, no IVUS was done. So maybe some under functional malapposition is possible in the LCX. And that's the reason for this stand thrombosis. So I, I, would I would like one, to add something. I have one question. Like when immediately you stented uh, the lift circuit in the first time and you came out and did EKG 15 minutes later, we saw some minor ST elevation. Was the patient truly pain free that time? Yeah, yep, yep. Symptomatic. Yes, was. That's so. That's so. Every fifteen minutes we are doing the ECGs because I'm yeah, asking the, every time that whether the patient is uh, really, really complaining anything. She, she, it, she took her dinner. She was smiling with her attendants. Everything she was doing. Now this is a little bit unusual because when you see a elevation, you expect some, uh, you know, occlusion of the artery, even intermittent or you know. Tra transient occlusion patient, we expect to have some symptoms. This is a little bit unusual presentation. You know that because all the time, uh, these sort of patients subjective feelings may not happen according, uh, in, in, yeah. in, in accordance with the ECG changes, you know? Mm -hmm. The most important thing is that you have to pay attention to the, the changes that are occurring. And as you have mm -hmm. said, you were mm -hmm. ordering that they repeat ECG every half an hour or 15 minutes. That's the mm -hmm. thing we should do, even when the patient is asymptomatic. Yeah, that's so the, that's the, the, what that's was the, the What yeah. was the reason for acute vessel closure? Yeah, that's I put here. The stand-related factor, no, I don't think so. Patient-related factors, yes. yeah, is patient has got... I think is this section may be the... Uh, the angiographically, it was not there. And because you know that not all the time I'm doing the IVAS for all kids, and especially yeah. for this tortuous LCX, long segment LCX, even IVAS catheter may not cross. So to do an IVAS for this, uh, this sort of long segment uh, up to the distal part of the... Maybe I, I can break the IVAS catheter. It happens sometimes. It happens so, sometimes. So, so I'm very much afraid of... LCX. Let, let me tell you my practice because if it's acute stent thrombosis mm -hmm. within 24 hours, it is the procedure, mm -hmm. procedure, procedure until yeah, proven otherwise. Told. That's that told so, already. No, no, I have taken the load. Yep. <laughs> right, right, right. The, so yeah. the three things is the, 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 the reason for acute vessel closure, and this is all studied, is the either the edge dissection, under expansion, or the inadequacy in the um, anticoagulation antiplatelets. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes we see these patients intubated and you give like oral antiplatelets not absorbed, not adequately covered. So you need to buy window so that uh, window time that, that there is a intravenous antiplatelet as well in those situations. I don't know in this patient, the ACT during the procedure was okay or not. Yeah, 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 it was, yeah, yeah, I have told already. Because, it's a yeah, spike yeah. satisfactory. Yeah, the spike then, satisfactory before PCI, just before PCI, I have given more potent like uh, ticker, yeah. ticker grill or loading to this patient also. Yeah. Because I have predicted so, that one, that, that uh, the LZ lesion and even the LED lesion has got 
sickness. And she's a black prone patient, actually. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I, I really, honestly, I, I do think that uh, IVAS is mandatory for mm -hmm. acute stent thrombosis because you really need to know what happened. Mm -hmm. But you came out good, so that's fine. Because no, if, I put another OB, stand. If you, you had an age dissection, I I put another stand already. This study, yeah. even if that's we have an age dissection, age dissection yeah. there, which has been solved, it has been resolved yes. by the stand. Agree. Agree. So th this is, you know, once in a blue moon it happens. It is in the it's the case of the last year. It happened last year in January. So. Once in a blue moon, because sometimes even you can't predict that one. This is one sort of case like this, and it it will remind you that all the time be careful for all the cages to do try to do the IVAS especially for the complex cages to find out whether the reason is there or not. So I think uh, I think I, I can close this case. Yes, move yes, to the please go ahead. My next case is also because this is uh, just a few months back. She's also a female, 58 years, came here from the periphery with uh, pain and shortness of breath and index pain so far, as per the patient's statement, 40 hours back. And she took that much time to come here. Uh, before that, locally in the hospital, she has been treated with low molecular heparin, even seeing the ECG. She has all the risk factors along with bronchial asthma too. And uh, this time with early LVF, which was very symptomatic indeed. Shopai here was raised. Admission, the ECG is very, very confusing and very interesting ECG, so I'm showing that one. So this is the baseline ECG and all the pathologies are here from V1 to V6. So with this ECG, you have, and she she is also a bit tachycardic with pathological in V1 to V6, borderline stimulations with positive T in V1 to V6. Yeah, I made a different question here, not the diagnosis of the ECG, rather than because she is a late comer stimulation MR, no doubt about it. Can you predict the viability of the myocardium from ECG of this late presenter STMI? It is a, an original myocardium from this ECP, a kinetic myocardium or hypokinetic to a kinetic myocardium. So not that much specific from ECG, but can predict something from there. So the poll has been started here. And by this time we can discuss. Badul fine. Actually, QF does not exclude the presence of viral myocardium. Yeah. And That's actually, it, yeah, viability of the myocardium, you cannot really predict with the QF changes alone. That is yeah. true. You have to do different modality. Uh, that's that's different question. Uh, but in, definitely, if it's like three months later, we see the ECG, we can we can we can call it like aneurysmal ST changes. <laughs> But you cannot tell the myocardium is viable or not. So, so according to you, it's a aneurysmal uh, changes in the. Uh, it's how how many? Reactive, 40 hours? So. 40 hours duration? Or yep, something? Yep, 30 hours. But he has positive T and also not, not, not just matching all the criteria of an aneurysm. Yeah, that is correct. But I think the question is not put correct because uh, the viability of the myocardium we cannot say. Not the discussion. viability. I'm telling about yeah. this. You're telling that whether yeah. from that ECG, whether any viable myocardium yeah. in terms of that aneurysm, in terms yeah. whether it is aneurysmal, in terms it is a, a kinetic that is not aneurysmal at all. Yeah. Some standard myocardium, some stunned or hibernating myocardium. Yeah, I, you know that from interventions perspective, whether I can, <laughs> yeah. I can Actually, give some benefit there or not. Okay. Or whether you'll touch can this I something? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when there is a persistent ST elevation mm -hmm. beyond the time for usual time for healing, 
after four mm-hmm. weeks, let's say, then I can say that there is a presence of aneurysm. Mm-hmm. Again, if there is a, uh, a old key web and the patient is, uh, I am doing an ATT, I find an ST elevation. That's a suggestive of this kinetic myocardium in that segment. Mm-hmm. But you cannot predict uh, seeing the uh, degree of ECD changes, how much mm-hmm. muscle is actually gone or- No, that's correct, yeah. That's something non-specific. I'm telling that ECG is not, but you can predict a little bit, not ECG, you can just throw it, throw it away that no, that's not the way only. Not like that, not that the nucleus can or CMR or whatever it is you're telling, but but at least ECG can, we can predict something that will not be that much hostile that yeah, whatever we'll do, it's not going to work. Not like that or like that. So here the C is there, hypoconnective to aconitic myocardium has been 53%. Why? Half is why? Why the, why the pole has Changes changed their mind and gone towards me. Sorry, Bangladesh is not doing well. So, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. very true. Yeah. So, um, no, I think uh, this is uh, this uh, debate about Q wave and viability. I think uh, this is not really a true uh, sort of. Uh, issue uh, in the context of recent MI. I, I think we should not put too much weight on the Q wave either way, because- That is correct, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I think- I'm going Yeah, I'm and going I think, uh, yeah so a couple of things, couple of things, and you know the recent publications in Jack about the late comers and PCI helps mm-hmm. or not. First MI, um, first MI registry. Also, right, and then also the, also we'll have to t- think about the OAT, which is 72 hours mm-hmm. after. Whether mm-hmm. But the wall motion sometimes is a problem, but if it is a you know, thinned out myocardium and dyskinetic, then probably in the context of Q wave, less likely to be in favor of viability. But before you write off, uh, it is important to evaluate the clinical context and see anything can be done. Now, if you want you to yeah. be objective, yeah. we can always do further studies to check the viability yeah, is yeah, there. Obviously, not. put everything everything together and give an answer. And, so, and also, yeah. in, 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 in any uh, recent MI, any recent MI, despite that the Q waves, always there will be some pre infectional ischemia, some viable tissue pre infectional area. So that's mm-hmm. also, you know, if, if, if the context is that area, then I'd say that any Q waves, it's recent MI, just within a few days, still will have some viable myocardium around that area. That is true always. Okay, but the question is how much percentage-wise viable and whether that viable is going to translate into functional improvement with uh, removal of the blockage. That's a different issue. Yeah, that's the question. That's why the different yeah. story, it's a different mm-hmm. story. Salvage of myocardium as much as you can, as fast as you can. Wave front phenomenon of the myocardial infarction propagation, you know, then 45% myocardial irreversibly injured. S55% is salvage in, in, in at least to bench test cells. And 33% up to three hours, six hours up to only this way from phenomena, only 10% person can remain there. So, and the ST, ECG, what from the perspective of ECG, some ST elevation later on, hours after ST elevation with decreased R wave, if Q wave begins, then Q wave inversion. That is most important. Q wave becomes deeper, ST normalizes days later. And then weeks later, it's TNT normal and pure persists. So this, this, this happens, but ultimately time is my priority. You know. So and coronary occlusion QT, that's a determination is very much hard. That's what I'm telling here. That's, that's, the, that's the, this question we are talking about this thing. Because first of all, symptom onset doesn't necessarily correlate with the duration or extent of the infarction, what the patient is telling. Secondly, reproduction is still beneficial in those with resolved ischemic symptoms, but ongoing ECG signs to have 48 hours after symptom onset. Thirdly, ECG can help determine the acute a little bit. Acute coronary occlusion in the absence of reperfusion, especially for the latecomer, typically produces sequential ECG changes like hyperacute T, then ST elevation, then Q, then Q of inversion, and finally, resolution of the ST elevation. 
And that's why a new Ted Nugent, which even I don't understand that much properly, the Anderson Wilkins acuteness scope, but especially for the late comers, that this has to be found to be superior to duration of symptoms for predicting benefit of reperfusion for my case also in both early and late presenters. So this Anderson Wilkins course, what is that one? Actually, it's actually now software guided automated. You can you can put in the you can get the answer. So this is this score like for this ECG. They have proved that this is point four. If the acuteness score is four, then and this depends on actually these three points: phase one A, phase one B, phase two A, phase two B. With this one A contains these sort of criteria like is elevation present or maybe absent, all TFs you should have, and abnormal TFs absent, this will take the, this will take four points, and then present positive T, and then QF absent, then phase 2A is the present all T and also QF present, and phase 2B present positive T or negative T or N negative T with, and also the abnormal QF present. So these, according to these three criteria, they are putting these scores here, and they have made that with the score four. If it is three or more than three, some activity or acute uh, myocardial infarction is there. It's not totally aneurysmal. Or if it's less than two or two, then you can tell this is aneurysmal. Another rule by Dr. Smith. That predict uh, the salvageable my myocardium or the original LV. Rule one is the sum of QF amplitudes in lead V1 to V4 divided by the sum of QRS amplitudes in lead one to V4 is greater than 0.22, which is easily we can make from the ECG, then acute ST segment elevation MI is predicted. And rule two is if any one lead V1 to V4 has QF amplitudes to QRS amplitude ratio greater than or equal to 0.36, then acute ST segment elevation is predicted. And that's why, additionally, what we can tell that T wave is to, or you can tell T wave by QRS complex amplitude has been utilized to press out STMI versus LV aneurysm. And more than 0.36 and to STMI, less than 0.36 LV aneurysm. So ultimately, it's all about T and Q in late comers. From both point of view, our case has acuteness, even as a late comer, and ejection fraction ECO has also revealed near echinacea of the LP apex with mid-range to reduce 40 to 45% ejection fraction. I think you will admit with these three points. Is there any comment from the experts? Your patient was is symptomatic. He yeah. she has come within 48 hours of onset of symptoms. So um, mm -hmm. even with key wear, she needs to go into cath lab. I'm putting I was putting these things together because sometimes you know coming from periphery is telling that she has started her pain 40 hours back, but actually may not be. And when you're seeing the when you're seeing the ECG, also you can you will be initially you you will not ju just uh, just you, you you sometimes you want to ask the question again and again whether when the chest pain really happened to you because this ECG is like a dramatic ECG of all the cues and the ST elevations and though the upright T is there is there. And the thing is that patient is complaining chest pain. That's true. If I take that it's a 40 hours pain within 48 hours limit, which is among in the guidelines of the ESC guidelines, up to 48 hours, you can even extend the primary PCI up to 48 hours if the patient is symptomatic. So from that point, not all the ECGs and even the patient's complaints may not be accurate. So that's why I have to do these things. So what has happened for these patients? What we should do for these patients? We'll go for, it's a class one recommendation. And that's the question is that go for investment, you can fix the IRA if needed. I think 
I think that question I can ask to the polls because this is also very important because you know that the pharmacoinvasive approach the, for the late comers, these issues are very warm and hot now in the whole world and in our country also. So why, whether we'll go for invasive angiography and fix the infertility artery if needed, it is yes or no. So oh, naturally, I also predicted the answer is like this. So 73% is in favor of yes. And that's true even according to the guidelines and also the time of this. And I, what obviously I was telling is I have put in the here the past my registry up to 48 hours, you should do everything, whatever you can for this patient. Even routine, even if the patient is not symptomatic, even for that one, according to ESC, it's a class two A recommendation. So you can go for it. So we went for CAG. It has got black burden there and the proximal LED. We did the PCI to infarctulated artery. With 2730 deaths, and also proper a position to make it confirm and show we have done the post dilatation also. And the final picture, if you can see, is there, any, uh, is there anything to think of it for this patient, the procedure related issue? Nobody happy is fine? Is it okay? I don't know that uh, Anderson Wilkins score of acuteness and then go by that, it is not that popular here. We don't, this was mm -hmm. early 20, 2000 you know, mm -hmm. um, publications, mm -hmm. but yeah. nowadays, you know, you need to have some, when the question comes in about viability and residual ischemia, then you go some other means, not just by the probability score from Anderson Wilkins. And the second thing is that, as you pointed out, if there is a post-infarct angina, that's probably good enough exactly. to, uh, to mm -hmm. go for the PCI. Now, you may ask, is this post-infarct angina pericarditis or is this post-infarct angina really post-infarct angina? That you need to uh, get some objectivity by serial EKG, any dynamic change, rising troponin, and it's still having pain, then you may salvage some of the peri-infarct ischemia burden. Um, and then another thing that we used to do in the old age, uh, that old um, time that before this lytics, and then do some low level modified bruise and see whether there is any ischemia. Many things you can do, but, uh, but within 48 hours, uh, as you pointed out, there's a good reason to go after. But the, the thing is that if it is uh, just uh, beyond, just I, I put that because the time for this patient is uh, is comfortable for us to go any either way. But the thing is that if it is go beyond forty eight hours, and if you arbitrarily, I'm telling that the patient has a infarcted artery totally occluded. We are not going to touch that one. Still, you agree with the vote. Uh, not it's not agreeing with the oath or not, but forty-eight to seventy-two, you are in the uncertain yeah, area. in the gray but zone. Yeah. After seventy-two, zone. because that's going by the book, yeah. you may do it. But you know, remember mm -hmm. this was Bronwald's brainchild concept yeah. that open artery hypothesis. That open artery, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, it did not show any benefit. So it is important that if somebody comes late and we open the in occluded artery, we came out. We come out good and then take the hero's thing, but it it involves cost, particularly in Bangladesh, for example. 
if this is an yeah. inferior MI and then LV function is 45 and patient come in three, four days later, I would argue that just leave it alone. Yeah, but uh, like, like what you were telling in the OAT, because only 50% of the patients were infarcturated artery was RCA yeah. in the OAT. So yeah. that's why they couldn't so no. get the benefit. No, no. We, yeah, we, that's we one do. thing. And another thing yeah. is that another thing is that the cluster recommendation for this is that asymptomatic infarct-related totally occluded artery don't touch it beyond seventy-two hours. Asymptomatic. But if it is symptomatic, then symptomatic. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> this patient. But I also... wanted to. So what I just wanted to because this is an EKG and beyond. We cannot get too much out of the EKG at that point. We need yeah. to help use the EKG as, as, as an adjunct to our mm -hmm. clinical hunch. And, 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 and also echo, echo might be also helpful because I don't know about the opinion of the other uh, experts in this group, but when the wall motion is dyskinetic, then it is a problem and thinned out dyskinetic ventricle, usually not a good sign, but, but it's still, you cannot bet because you'll have to do some viability st study if you want to be like really academic, but go by your mm -hmm. hunch because in Bangladesh, it can be challenging. No, I'm telling in the globally, globally, because you know that now globally, this fast my registry, this, uh, this, you know, these things are happening. Why? Because late comers are there, even around 20 to 40% in Europe, late comers. <laughs> So for the late comers, it's really a problem, and we have to discuss globally that what we should do, because right. there is so, a problem so let me, with let the, me beyond, the 70, beyond seventy-two hours. It's a really so, a problem that why, so, so, what you will do. So late comers, we need to be very careful about what is late. So mm -hmm. within six hours, within three hours, within three hours, TPA is as competitive as PCI. Three to six hours, we start seeing PCI performing better than TPA. And then beyond six to 12 hours, within 12 hours, TPA can be given from the latest study. After 12 hours, I would request that, please don't give TPA. You need to think about PCI at that point. Give antiplatelets, anticoagulation, ship the patient out, and then go for PCI. After 48 hours, start thinking not doing anything because of the cost. But after 72 hours and no chest pain, then it is very important to just think about how to- If the patient, uh, symptom, if the patient is symptomatic. Yes, yes, yeah. If the patient is symptomatic, that's what I'm saying. You need it's, to go in. It's your judgment call, yeah. Yeah. Because that is, that is post, post in fact angina, that's different. Yeah. That means that's still there. That's what I'm Yeah, because because that, muscle one, does not cry. that one is not, uh, that, that one is not included in the trials also, you know, that the Gracia trial, the CM3 trial, all these trials, they are, they're dealing with the late comers and they're dealing with the format invasive strategy. They're going up to the 48 hours, up to 17 or 18 hours later, they are doing the angiograms and uh, even for the asymptomatic patient, this is possible, but up to 48 hours. Beyond 48 hours, there is that red hashtag, like don't touch an infarcturated artery, occluded right. infarcturated artery. But again, I'm asking you, you all the panelists, if it is not occluded like this patient, whether you will not touch that one, it's not occluded. Okay, so let me tell you, I jump on this, sorry. First of all, what, Saidud, thank you very much for bringing this EKG up because I always say that EKG is a helpful tool, but clinical context is important. And QF doesn't mean either way. Do not write off just seeing the QF. The game may not be over yet. And the mm -hmm. second point is that when, when you go, when you, in cardiology, we have two kinds of thinking. One, before you go to the cath lab, decision-making to the go to cath lab. And once you go into the war, then you are in war. Then it is a different, different thing. So you cannot just uh, decide about, you know, go to uh, bomb Iraq and then come out. You have to have a plan. And there, there should be yeah. a comprehensive exit plan. Yeah. So yeah. if you yeah. see this, what do you do? It may, get, it may change. And that exactly you are asking that yeah. first of all, should the, we should go or not? And then we see closed one thing, but what about 95%? Will you leave that alone? 
Yeah, yeah, that's I'm telling uh, because these are the common good. questions. You can, know. We, can we go, go ahead? We have only yep, seen only yep, two cases. Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, and I have put only two cases here. So this is then. Watch. Okay, that's why I'm going elaborately with this sort of ECGs <laughs> and other things. Uh, this is the ECG, post PCI ECG. Anything, anything new here? Nothing new because even what you can see the changes. If I put the previous ECG, the V6 has been upright. Yeah. After PCI. Nothing that much to be easily. But at least there is no harm I have done. But the, but the V6, V6 change, you cannot comment on it because you did, not mark the, you did not mark that's the location I'm of the electrodes. So yep. that will be tough to compare. That's what I'm telling, nothing contributory it is. So after that, but it didn't, but life is not so easy sometimes. Can you believe the same patient's ECG after 45 minutes? I don't see the oh, Have you seen the ECG now? Have you seen the ECG? Yeah, this is the elevation going on. Yep, here. Mm -hmm. And the patient getting angina? Yeah, the patient is yeah, literally patient screaming. Is screaming. So, which means that there was that, that, that there was a. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, no, I know, I know that one because you know that the participants are there. They can see these ECGs and they can really, really uh, understand that uh, that these sort of things may happen post PCI or two days after post PCI. It may happen. So when seeing the ECGs, so how they will react? I don't see the EKG. You didn't see the EKG? It's there. Now I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And I know this answer is very pretty common correlation between patient symptoms and the ECG change. But this year also, we have to remember that the patient is tachycardic, sympathetic over is there. That means some sort of ischemia is there and patient is literally skimming for some good reason. So this, this tachycardia is also very much important to understand in acute stage. This is also I want to put in the, in the participants' part. So that this is important. The, 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 the be careful about a couple of things here. One is that ST elevation is there, but tachycardia is a new change. And in a yeah. discanetic LV, the tachycardia will worsen the ST elevation or mm -hmm. pre-existing ST elevation. So uh, the, there, I don't know uh, whether the patient is having severe chest pain or not, but is literally the patient screaming. having any, any heart failure screaming. signs? Patient is screaming. literally screaming. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're not seeing that one, maybe. <laughs> so, 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 which is which is I call it. Uh, if it is raining, you go out, you get wet. Yeah. So, ultimately, this is then question is that if which new change compared to the previous ECG are you concerned about? Here's some new changes there. If you go. You, if you just uh, compare the previous issue, in all lists or especially in some other lists. So I think the answer will be all of above. That is correct. <laughs> that should be. But you know, these sort of things, like, but also you see that one, 
AVL was not that much in the baseline scene. But here is also one AVL. The ST is getting elevated. The C. No, there's quite spread there. Yeah, just very much spread. Because that's why I have to test this. Yeah, this is confusing. That's why. So which one will get the which one will be very much concerned? But what is it? What's your comment? Actually, every change are significant. So all of the above actually the most reasonable. Why the why the pool is thinking in that way? Is there something different they're thinking in a different way? Or? No, the pole did not have an E. Oh, they didn't see the E? There was no E in the pole. It was only A, B, C, D. No, oh, that's E has been, oh, E is not there. That's the problem. Okay. But still, they have, they, have been, uh, they have been mixed up with different types of uh, Comments like one ABL there, this new change is there. So I can exit from here. Yeah. So like alarm in the air. Relook geogram was done. Why my thing is not good? And you can see something here. Still, some flow is preserved in LED territory, but yet there are thrombus floating in the within the standard segment, evolving acute stent thrombosis. So, what we have done very insistent, but we needed extensive dilatation along with ICGPI to fix it. And this is the final result. ECG after re-intervention, again, it came back to what we have seen. And 12 hours after intervention, everything comes down. Even the bread, tachycardia comes down, everything comes down. So that's the point here. So I'm wrapping up here. I'm just, well, I just want to say that coronary intervention itself has many minute details to remember, to follow and to implement, but it actually means more and more to know about the ECG. To follow the ECG before, even for the interventionist, before, during, and after the procedure, very meticulously. Rather you can tell, we should be obsessed with ECG in monitors and in black and white papers. Thanks for your patience, Yari. I'm finishing here. Other thing? Yes, Professor Saidurman. Oh, other way, yes. So what do you think of why the stent had a problem on the LED? Yeah, the same question. So I didn't put all these factors there. So I think for the, this, this one, I don't know, actually. I don't know, actually, for this patient. Because you know that this is old, uh, you know, the, the hours later and later, the thrombus becomes uh, so solidifying. And the resolution of the clots may not happen sometimes. You, you know, in your experience also, sometimes even whatever you are doing, whatever you are doing, the clot is remaining in somewhere in the corner or somewhere there. And something, you, even some of the clots you have been trapped in between the stent and the wall, but even something is coming out. We have loaded but this patient with it, I see, and other things also there. So, you know, that once in a blue moon it happens, and maybe maybe we have done the post dilatations. So, a malaposition or under expansion is, uh, we didn't predict but that you, one. But, but you had a good runoff, right? Digital runoff was good in the first procedure? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Very good runoff. Very good runoff. No, 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 like no, nothing like distal embolization that much. Okay. 
So at least your patient is good and Bangladesh is 57 for two. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I'm also seeing that one. Okay. Other way, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, can you stop your screen yeah, sharing? I have stopped sharing. So, Professor Saeed Rahman, excellent, excellent. Actually, all in two, two cases, but many issues is very beautiful presentation. Actually, there are many informations and I think and an extraordinary presentation. Slides are excellent, beautiful slide preparation, everything, Saeed Rahman. Yeah. Thank you Actually, very much. Participant enjoyed it a lot and they have sent many messages to you. Congratulations. So <laughs> Thank you very one. much. Thank you. So I'd like to request Rupi Khamet, sir. Actually, the participants are waiting for your at least. No, uh, yeah. Atahar, uh? I think it's late today. It's almost 11 o'clock, but I want I don't want to present a CJ because it will take time. Um, what I want to do. I want to show something which is not ECG. I would like everybody to find and read this book. It's, <laughs> it's a very interesting book, um, right, written by Modusri Mukherjee. She is actually a physicist and became a writer. It's not a fiction. It is more of a research paper and it has a lot of references. So if you can find this book uh, and that will give you real good perspective of, you know, and we thought but you need to read this book. Um, you can get it online or you can get it e-publication. I urge everybody to read this book. It's a fantastic book. Um, what the British did uh, in the beginning and towards the end of their empire. In the beginning, they used Bengal to bankroll their invasion of rest of India. And towards the end, they did the same thing. The Second World War, uh, they, they were in debt to India um, uh, at the sterling debt in the beginning. And they always talk, you know, people always talk about that well, British made railways for us, blah, 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 all those things. These are all paid by us. And this book actually has researched all the papers because these are all preserved in British archives. And she has gone through these papers and put references where she got those documents. So please read it. Uh, it it's something that will be a good, good eye opener for all of us. And uh, I think it's getting late. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it'll be difficult for people to keep concentration. Uh, today. Thank you. Sir? Given that today is, uh, we have the game of Bangladesh with Scotland, so I actually <laughs> it's quite difficult to concentrate. Yes. Sir, sir, Rubik, sir? Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Sir, actually, uh, the last day's ladder diagram actually excellent presentation and our participant actually enjoyed it very lot sir is it possible for you to present the next sunday sir whole session uh next sunday yeah sure sir next sunday the whole session will be yours sir actually okay all right we'll do that so thank you sir All right, thank you, Rory.